But I want to start out with a question for you. How many of you, and this is one of those interactive things, how many of you love to play games? Anybody like to do games? Let me see. What about, um, what about like physical games like football, baseball, soccer? Anybody like that? Uh, maybe something more challenging like badminton, croquet? Right? Anybody play killer badminton? Where you wait the bird, right? So when you hit it and it drills them in the head, they're like out. Right? That's my childhood, but we won't go there. Um, what about board games? Anybody like board games? Right? Yeah? You like chess? Now, now let me ask you this, because I know we're, we're just kind of a diverse uh, group here. How many of you read the regulation book? <laughs> I mean, like, you will read what the rules are. Now, it depends. I mean, the kids, when they were growing up, it was like one page of rules. I'm all in, right? Gets more than that. I'm like, we'll figure it out, right? I mean, that's, that's, we're not inclined towards rules and, and actually digging after them. I remember, you know, when I was a kid, uh, I was probably like, uh, five, six, seven, somewhere in there. I don't remember the exact age, but I wanted to play football. And so we just always had backyard football games going. And I remember uh, the big kids let me play. And I was just ecstatic. And they kept calling me offsides. They're like, you're offsides. And I'm like, I don't understand. And they're like, you crossed the line of scrimmage before the ball was hiked. Like, the what? And they said, the line of scrimmage. You can't cross that line. And I remember just staring at the dirt. <laughs> just trying to figure out, where is that line? And I remember being so frustrated. I was like, you must have to have some magical power that comes when you turn seven that you can see this kind of line. Because I couldn't see it. And finally, one of them was like, you stupid, you can't see the line. I was like, oh, okay. And so that kind of began my, my learning rules and regulations. Now, uh, of those of you who played football, how many of you read the regulation book? Anybody? Come on. Well, I never did either, so don't feel bad. Right? But uh, my, my point is, is that, you know, when it comes to a lot of things in life, we're not naturally inclined. Some of us are. Some of us like those rules and regulations but some of us are just like, I just want to do the game. I don't want to get into all the details and I'll figure it out as I go. You know, David, King David made an interesting statement. He wrote in Psalm 119, he says, Oh, how I love your law. It's my meditation all the day. And I remember reading that and I was like, wow, David. Where, where was your mind and your heart? Because mine doesn't always line up like that, that, that I love the law. I mean, I like, like Psalm 23. I like to meditate on some scripture, right? But, but the law. And, and so there was something I was missing. And so I, I thought, you know, this is good for us to dig into the law. Actually, that's what we're going to do for the next 10 weeks. We're going to do the Ten Commandments. So we're going to do one commandment. Each week, and so my prayer for us is that we will basically have the same heart that David did, where we're like, God, man, I really love your law. I just, I meditate on it. Now, to be honest, there's some laws, when we talk about laws, there are some laws that, that we like, that are good. I mean, how many of you think that the law that says do not murder is a good law, right? It's a good law. We like that law. Some laws we do not like. Like if you're in, in the city and you're trying to go somewhere and you need to turn and it says one way. Right? That's not a law that I like. Some laws, some laws, I got to tell you, they're just, you scratch your head and you say, what were you thinking when you came up with that law? So just a, a little insight for me. One of, I'm, I'm not a big reader, but I do like classic literature. And so one of my favorite books is uh, Uncle John's Bathroom Reader. And uh, <laughs> comes in many volumes, and it's out there for you guys. You can get it on Amazon. It's a, it's a great download book for your personal library, or in our case, the bathroom, right? But, uh, 
uh, it has, in many of the volumes, it'll have a category called loony laws. And you just have to scratch your head and you wonder about these. So I thought, well, let me just bring some of these out of the book and, and share them with you. Right? Here's one for you. In Shawnee, Oklahoma, it's illegal for three or more dogs to meet on private property without the consent of the owner. Obviously, a cat person <laughs> wrote that law. Right? Uh, what about this one? In Hartford, Connecticut, transporting a cadaver by taxi is punishable by a $5 fine. You just want to know what brought that law about. <laughs> you don't want to use the funeral homes there in Hartford. That's all I'm saying. Um, what about this one? If you tie an elephant to a parking meter in Orlando, Florida, you have to feed the meter just as if the elephant were a car. All right, see? So these are good things to know. Or this one, it's against the law to anchor your boat to the train tracks in Jefferson City, Missouri. So, and, and then just one more, because I know that, that you will appreciate this one. In the state of Kentucky, the law requires that every person in the state takes a bath at least once a year. Right? Hey, at least they're hygiene conscious. Indiana, we got squat. We just figure you'll do it because others will beat you up if you don't, right? But so, so there's all these laws, and some of them, like I said, some of them are ones that we agree with, some we don't care for, some of them we scratch our heads. But, you know, when it comes to God's Word and the law that He lays out for us, my, my heart is, is that we will actually see the law then as one of the greatest gifts that, that God could give, that we could receive and understand how that law is a reflection of Him and His heart's desire for how we are called uh, to live. You know, there's a, a scripture I want to take you to. Let's go ahead and put that uh, uh, address up for you. If you get your Bibles, let's go to Mark chapter 12 is where I want to go this morning. And so that's the gospel of Mark in the New Testament. So get your Bible. Let's turn there. If you don't have a Bible, look under the seat down in front of you. And like we say, if you don't own a Bible, we want you to have that one. So this is Jesus. Uh, he's with the scribes and and uh, they're going to bring the question to him. And we've talked about this in the past, but it's, I think it's uh, very foundational for where we are today. Look at chapter 12, the Gospel of Mark, starting at verse 28. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, he being Jesus, they asked him, Which commandment is the most important of all? And Jesus answered, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So for them to ask Jesus this question, that was not uncommon. And I encourage you just to, in your own time, continue to read there. Because sometimes when it comes to the Pharisees or to the scribes, we have kind of a negative view. And some of them actually had genuine hearts for God. See, their desire was to truly understand the law. They were basically biblical lawyers. And so their job was to make sure that they had a clear understanding of what the law was. And so it was very common for them to ask, particularly a rabbi, what do you think is the greatest commandment? I liked one of them. He, uh, he responded when they asked them, they said, what, what's the most important law? And he says, the most important law is the one you're about to break. I was like, oh, well, that's good. But see, I think Jesus, Jesus basically tops all the answers that they had heard so far. And it's interesting because when they ask this question, they're really asking, which of the, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, do you see as, as the most important, as key, as foundational? And, and if you don't have the Ten Commandments, you still have 613 Levitical laws. And so which of those do you think 
are, is the key foundation for everything. And it's interesting because what you see in Jesus' response is he doesn't go to the Ten Commandments. He goes to Deuteronomy, and, and this is going to be in chapter 6, and he's actually quoting the Shema. Now see, he's not. He, this is in Deuteronomy, Moses has repeated the Ten Commandments that he uh, did in Exodus, and then in, he has the Shema, what's called the Shema, and that is Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elohei. Nu Adonai Ehad. It says here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. The Lord is one. And so Jesus begins with this statement. It's the central prayer of Judaism. It is the basic prayer. It's very, it is the one thing that, that parents teach their, their children growing up. It's the first thing. It's foundational. It's like you teaching your, your kids, Jesus loves me. It is that foundational. And so Jesus begins this with uh, Shema Yisrael. And here, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is Ahad, which means it's the Hebrew word for one. And so he starts it this way, and he gets this, he reads this. This is what Moses had read to the people. And so Moses, when he receives that law from God, he takes the law to the people And the first one he gives is, you shall have no other gods before me. Let me do this. Let me put the Ten Commandments just as kind of a refresher. Let's put the Ten Commandments up there. These are the the Ten Laws. And let's read these together. We're going to do the left column and then the right column. So just, just join me in reading them. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not lie. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, wife, or property. So what Jesus did here is he divides this really in two. You've got those first five laws all deal with God and his authority in the world. So you have his authority in that he says, you know, you shall have no other God. You shall not make for yourself any idols. You shall not misuse my name, right? Remember the Sabbath, right? Keep the Sabbath. That's that time where we pause and we reflect on who God is. Even, even his authority in the structure of how we set up the families and honoring your father and your mother. So that's the first half. And then the second half, the next five, all deal with our relationship with one another. And so it's interesting. Jesus, when they ask him what the greatest commandment is, he's like, well, the greatest commandment is this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So he actually takes the law and he divides it perfectly in two. Love God. Love people. And you cannot separate it. You cannot do one without the other. And so Jesus lays this out, and so pretty much what he's talking about, that vertical relationship and loving God, and that horizontal relationship and loving people. Now let's go back here to Exodus 20, because I want to look at when Moses uh, first gives uh, the Ten Commandments. And I want us to look there, go to Exodus, it's like the second book, right? Second book in your Bible, it's easy to find. Uh, So Exodus chapter 20. And I'm just going to read those first three verses. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. So this is the first and key law. We're going to see everything is going to flow out of this one commandment. Now let's understand. Let's understand this. He says, notice here, he says, you shall have no other gods before me. So let's understand what that means before me. Because it's not like, 
God is saying, okay, on your list of gods, I want to be at the top. Right? Don't you be pinning in any other God before my name. Right? That's not what he's talking about here. That's not what that, that means actually in the Hebrew. Uh, in Hebrew, before me, uh, the literal translation of that is in my presence. In my presence. In my presence, he says, there is to be nothing else that would qualify as a God in your life. It's, it's not that God is wanting to be number one in your life. He wants to be the only one. Right? It's not like he's playing American Idol here with you and trying to make a, a, the finalist. Right? He's like, no, I want to be the one and only. I don't want to be in second. I want to be in third because there is no place for God. That's what he says. There is no second place for me. I want to be the one and only. If I'm not, if I'm not the one and only, then I'm not God. That's what he's telling us. He's giving us this, this understanding. He is to be the supremacy in our life. Let me help you understand this, what he means by this. Uh, guys, uh, look in your wife's eyes and tell her, Honey, I just want you to know you will always be my number one wife. No matter how many wives I take, no matter how many women I get, you'll always be number one with me. Yeah, yeah. Some of you are like, I would not even survive getting out of here, right? I wouldn't survive the day. And this is what God is saying to us. He's like, no, you're not going to have anything else in my presence. I'm going to be the only one. Now, I would tell you that, that this particular law, I think we can look at that. You shall have no other gods before me. And I think, you know, we may check out on it and say, I, I think I'm okay. Because if you come in my house, you're not going to find uh, any statues. Uh, I haven't been sacrificing farm animals to anything, right? Uh, I haven't been doing anything like that, so I, I think I'm clear. But, but I would suggest to you, a lot of times we don't understand what God means when he talks about having gods before him. What this word means, idolatry. When we put up idols, when we put anything before him. We don't understand idolatry, and honestly we don't understand worship and how those two go hand in hand. I know uh, some of us, you know, are like, well... I don't know that I have any idols. Well, let me give you a definition of what an idol is and, and help you to understand what he's talking about. An idol, an idol is anything that we put in the place, anything that we put in the place of God in our lives. So it's anything that you consider to be more important, anything you consider to be so central, Anything you consider to be so essential, you cannot, think about this, you cannot imagine doing life without it. Do you have anything in your life right now that you're just like, man, I cannot imagine even doing life without it? Here's something I want you to understand. This is true for all of us in this room. We are all hardwired to worship. Now I get some of you are like, well, you know, I'm not really a big worshiper, right? I mean, we do the music, and, and that's just not my thing, but that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm, I'm saying that we are all hardwired to worship something. So what is it in your life that you just are like, man, if I don't have this... It's just not worth it. Life doesn't have meaning. Life doesn't have purpose. What do you consider that to be? Is it, is it money? I mean, is, is money the key? Is it, is it your work? Is it your, your bank account? Is it your uh, achievements? Is it all about your, your spouse? Or maybe it's about your not having a spouse? Is that, is that like the key thing? Is that what's so important? Because God's like, I want your heart. I want your heart. And so an idol is that thing that, that we put in place above God be, before anything. 
let me just take you through some questions here, okay? Because these, these are questions that I think we need to ask and really, really search our heart in when it comes to kind of sorting out. Because I recognize that sometimes we're like, I don't know if I have those idols. And so let's look at, let's look at some of these questions. Here's the first question that I have for you. What do you love? What do you love the most in your life? What do you love the most? What is it that, like I said, you cannot do without? You have to have. What is it that you pursue more than anything? What is it you pursue more than anything? Because what we, what we love, we, we will absolutely pursue. What we love, we'll absolutely pursue. What is that? In your life. And, and what I want to encourage you to do is as we go through this, is be honest with yourself. I mean, it doesn't do any good to lie, lie to yourself and just to blow over it. That that achieves nothing. See, we want to, we want to be honest in our estimation of ourselves. What is, what is the one thing that you want actually more than God? See, the reason I bring this up is these are things that we have to check our hearts on. All of us have this tendency. All of us can fall into this pattern. C.S. Lewis just made a, a, a great statement. He said, our hearts are idle factories. Have you noticed this? Have you ever noticed this in your life that um, God blesses us with good things? He can give us good things and our propensity, our tendency is to take the good things He gives and to put them before Him. Have you guys noticed that? I mean, I've had that throughout my life. There's still things in my life that I battle with this. Because God loves us because He's good. He's always giving us good things. But we have this tendency that, that I want to take those things that He gives and, and I put those actually before Him so I end up pursuing that thing more than I do pursue God. It's that thing that I put my trust in. It's that thing that, that gets my obedience. It's that, that that gets my response. It gets my heart. And that's why, that's why we have to guard our hearts. So I said, you are hardwired to worship. You're hardwired to go after these things. And now here's the thing. Worship for you and pursuing that is the same. It's just as natural to you as breathing is. Okay? Just as, how many of you enjoy breathing? Right? You like breathing. Breathing's good. The only time that breathing is bad is when we're inhaling something toxic, right? Something that could be harmful. And and you know what? Try as hard as you may, you would still breathe it in. You can only hold your breath for so long. And so the issue here is not breathing. The issue here is, are you breathing in that which brings life? Or are you breathing in that which brings death? Worship is the same way. Do you worship that which brings you life? Or do you worship that which brings you death? And you can tell the things that we worship. The things that we worship are the things that, you know what, we will, we will sacrifice for. We will sacrifice those things. The, that which we worship, we sacrifice for. They go hand in hand. So, so what is this thing in your life? Is there something in your life or someone in your life, whatever that is, that I want more than God, that I've wanted more than God? Like I said, it can be all kinds of stuff. It can be that, that relationship. That it can be you know, relational. It can be monetary. It can be my drive for success. It can, it can fall in any category. What about this? What do you trust more or the most? What do you, put, what do you trust in the most? 
What's that one thing that you need? Think about this. What's the one thing you need that makes you feel the most secure about the future? That, that you're just like, man, as long as I have fill in the blank, I'll be fine. What do you need to have in your life to have that kind of security? As long as I have my job. As long as I have my job, I'm okay. All right? As long as I have my investments, my portfolio, my bank account, as long as it's all in the black and I got my savings, I'm okay. You know, as long as I have my spouse, as long as I have my family, I'm okay. As long as I have my health, I'm okay. As long as I have my good looks, I'm, I gave that up a long time ago, but I'm okay, right? See, it's whatever we put our trust in, in and that, that we need, that we feel like we have to have in order for life to be okay. It, what is it that if it was missing, it would not be okay? It would not be okay. What about this? What, what commands your obedience? What is it that you have a hard time saying no to? What's, what's the temptation that draws you? I mean, is it, is it sex? Is it pornography? Is that what has its claws into you? Maybe it's, I don't know, maybe it's food? Maybe it's that drive for, for making money or to achieve success? Maybe it's, it's gaming, right? Online gaming, getting online. Maybe it's phone separation anxiety. I mean, in our culture, we can't be away from our phones. I mean, maybe it's, you know, maybe it's being enslaved to the opinions of others. And I have to have other people just speak into my life and affirm me all the time to, to, to tell me how great I am or how cool or how awesome. See, an idol, it's, it's anything that we put in place of God in our lives. That's what an idol is. Anything that you love more than God, trust more than God, obey more than God. And see, God is the one. This is what he's saying. No, I'm to be the one and only in your life. God's God's not just content to be the important thing in your life or a priority. He says, I want to be the only one. Not just one of many, but the only one. And that's what he calls us to. I tell you, sometimes, and maybe you agree with me or not, I think that what God calls us to and, and where he wants to be in our life is sometimes scary. That he wants to be so big and so large in our life that he demands everything from us. And for some of us, that's a scary thing because we're more comfortable when we can put God down into a manageable box where he's going to behave. And it just gets outright scary when he comes at us and says, don't you be holding anything back on me. I want all of you. I want all of your heart. I want to be the primary one. I don't even have any others on the playing field. I mean, this is why, you know, one of the, one of the scriptures, I think, that, you know, as a pastor, uh, uh, people who are young in the faith will, will come to me with is when Jesus makes that statement that uh, if you're going to follow me, you have to hate your mother and father, even your own flesh and blood. And, and they're like, what? What do you mean? Am I supposed to hate them? And I'm like, no, Jesus is doing a comparison here. He's like comparing your love for him. Uh, Your love for him is so great, it's like you hate everything else. He's not calling us to hate, but what he's calling to, what he's calling us to is to have a heart that is absolutely, completely devoted to him. Because see, when he gives us the law, here's the other thing I want you to get this morning. When he gives us the law, yes, there's things that we are to do and not do. But God is always about the heart, not the list. He's about a heart that willingly follows that which he lays out. Why? Because we love him. It's not just a a checklist 
of things to go through and say, okay, did that, did that, didn't do that. That's good, didn't do that, so I'm good. I mean, in fact, Scripture, in Scripture we have two examples. We have two examples of two men who obeyed all the law. And one of them got it, and one of them didn't. Okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this up here. So the first one we read is the rich young ruler. And the rich young ruler, he's there in Matthew and Mark and in Luke. He's in, in all the Gospels. And so there's this exchange between Jesus and this rich young ruler who, who comes to Jesus. And he, he asks him, you know, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus is like, well, you know the commandments, and you know you can tell the guy's just kind of nodding, like, uh huh, because Jesus is like, don't com- you know, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie. And the guy's like, you know what? Uh, I've kept all those since I was young. But here's the thing. This is what I love about Jesus, is that he looks right into the heart, and he sees what's in the heart, and he makes an interesting statement to the man. Because he says, I've been doing all these. And then Jesus, because he knows what's in this man's heart, he knows that there's something he actually loves more than God. He says, okay, how about this? Go sell everything you have and come follow me. Does anybody remember what his response was? It says he went away. Does anybody remember how he went away? Sad. He was bummed because he's like, man, I don't want to give all that up. It's like Jesus, you know, he looked into this young man's heart and he knew that this young man worshipped money more than he did God. And, and he proved it because the young man, you know what, his obedience had limits and conditions on it. All right? It's interesting. He, he was very religious, followed all the rules, right? lived up to the religious standard, and yet his heart was not... Fully devoted to God. It had conditions and limitations. Let me, let me ask you this. Does your obedience have any conditions on it? Is it, God, I will follow you, but don't ask me to do blank. God, I will follow you, but don't ask me to give up blank. God, I will follow you, but don't take blank. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I remember that as a young age. God, I'll follow you. Don't make me go to Africa. Anybody have that fear? I just know if I follow Jesus, he'll make me go far away and leave my home and, and, and everything. I mean, I just feared that. All right? And, and we have those conditions that we put on God. Now, here's the thing. Whatever that blank is, here's what I want you to understand. That is idolatry. That's idolatry. Whatever that blank is that we go after instead of God, that's idolatry. And that's what Jesus says. No, you have to lay that down. You have to renounce it. Otherwise, he says, you can't be my disciple. Now, the other example he gives us here is that of Abraham. You remember the story of Abraham? I don't have time to go through Abraham's whole story, but suffice to say, God asked him to give up that which he most loved. You guys remember what it was? It was his son. His promised son. And God's like, I want you to take him up. and I want you to offer him up to me in a sacrifice. Abraham didn't even hesitate. Took his son up to the mountain. Took Isaac up to the mountain. He was ready to go through with it. God's not interested in human sacrifice like that. He was interested in Abraham's heart. See, the point here is, in both of these guys, is you know what? You can be extremely religious. You can be very religious here today. You can speak Christianese. You can do all the do's and not do any of the don'ts. You know, you can even be a church leader. You could even be a pastor and God still not be your God. How is that possible? Because I can go through the motions. I can check the boxes. But I can still have something in my life that I desire and want that has more value to me than knowing God. I can still have those things in my life that I put my trust in more than I do God. See, it's all possible. And and I think this morning, I think a lot of times, the reason we pursue these other idols is because we do not get who God is. 
we do not get the immensity and the awesomeness of who it is who loves us. I, I just don't think that we get that. I don't think we get just his, his value and what a treasure he is, what it is to know him. I, I think, you know, there, there's times in my walk where, like, I just see it crystal clear and then, I don't know about you, but there's times in my walk where it gets cloudy and I tend to lose sight and, and I find myself running after something over here. And by God's grace, he gets my attention. He's like, stop it. Look back to me. See, it's coming to that realization of, of how invaluable and measurable knowing God is. And, and do you grasp that? See, I want to point out to you the danger of of idolatry this morning. I want you to get that, but, but what I want you to get even more is just begin to understand who God is. See, when we begin to get that, all those things that we're tempted to go after and to put above him, they begin to fade away because you begin to realize that nothing compares to him. Nothing will ever compare to him. I love that, that Jesus gave a, a parable, and, and I love this because he did it in one verse. He did it in one verse talking about the kingdom of God in Matthew 13, 44. He says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. You know, we don't have a lot of details in this story, but what he's trying to get you to understand is the immeasurable value of, of knowing God. Because notice he says he finds this treasure, right? And then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has. And I just remember as a kid, I was, anybody go treasure hunting? Like I dug up holes in our yard all over. Because I was just sure that some pirate buried a treasure there. Right? And, and we, we'd love to find that. It's like, man, I would love to be that person. You know, you, you see it on the news sometimes. Somebody that just uncovers this immense treasure. And see, that's what he's saying. This is a man who uncovered it. He discovered it. And he recognizes the immense value of it. And because of the value of it, he's like, man, I'm looking at how much this is worth. And it's worth everything I have. It's worth all that I own. It's worth all that I possess. And Jesus is telling us this is what it is to know God. There is nothing that we can pursue. There is nothing that we can go after that is even comparable. And yet we're always afraid. Isn't this true? We're always afraid of what we will lose. Aren't we? Aren't we afraid? We're, we're, we're always afraid, well, God, if I give you everything... What am I going to have? And that's what I'm saying. You do not get what you're trading. You know, the man in this parable, he knew exactly what he was getting. And he's like, it is absolutely worth it. It's absolutely worth it for me to, to give up everything. And that's what I'm saying. As you begin to have this realization and understand who God is, then you begin to put those things in light that we, that we tend to chase after God. And so... Our, our tendency to run after these things kind of fades because we recognize who God is. Does that make sense? As your heart pursues Him, those idols begin to fade away. So just as I close today, let's just do a bit of a personal inventory. Just between you and God, what does He lay on your heart? What, is, is there something in your life that right now has your attention, that right now has your heart, that right now has your trust? Is there something in there that grabs your obedience? Is there, what is it that, that dictates and prioritizes your life? What is it that you treasure? What is it that you will sacrifice and give up? Time, money, sometimes relationships in order to get. What is that? And see, the red flag comes up when it's not God. That's why we do this inventory. What is it in your life that tends to push God off to the side and causes you to make decisions 
not based on who God is. What about this? Just give you this challenge. If each day, just recite this statement as you go into your day. I will have no one or nothing before you, God, in my life. And you just begin to focus that as you, as you start. God, I'm not going to let anything become, come between you and me. And let that be your heart's cry. And then just ask God. Here's an honest thing to do, because I, I've done this myself. Is just to say, God, you know, help me in seeing who you are. Help me in understanding the value of what it is to know you and to love you. And see, God gives us that grace and he'll begin to unfold things and help us to understand things. And then I promise you this, you will be overwhelmed by the depth of his love. His love for you. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. We close. I'm going to ask you to stand as we close uh, in prayer and, and just encourage you. Uh, do not put off the Holy Spirit when he's working. This space up here is, is a place for prayer, for worship, for those life markers. We have those who will come and pray with you. But when the Holy Spirit works, he brings to our mind. We know the things. It's like you, you know when he's working because sometimes we just fight that. What is it that we put before God? What is it that we've set up that we seek more than Him? Let's pray. Father, just ask that, that Holy Spirit, you work here in our lives. We want to be a people who love you with our whole heart. We want to be a people that when we come before you, we're not dragging along other gods, other idols in our lives, that our hearts are wholly devoted to you. Help us to have that heart this morning, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I love that contrast between the rich young ruler and the man who finds the treasure in the field. One walks away only being able to think about everything he's going to lose. And the other one walks away and is thinking about everything he's going to gain. And we, we do this. We, we come to God and we have no other gods before him when we realize who Christ really is and what God really is to us. We gain everything and we lose nothing. And so if you're struggling this morning wondering, you know, can I really afford to let that thing go in my life, to change how I live my life in this way, in this area? Just put your eyes on Christ. <laughs> and the answer will be yes. You can afford that because you're going to gain everything. Let's, let's stand amazed in the presence of Jesus this morning.
Let's go knowing you are loved. Let's go and love well this week. We'll see you soon.